Coming up, we're going to go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year, the great year of 1984. We're not going to stop there. After we count them down, we're re-ranking them according to all-time streams and views, and to find out which one has left the biggest mark on history since. This time around, we've got some of the greatest hits from the 80s. They're all duking it out for that coveted number one spot. But who will be the champion? Will it be Van Halen? Will it be Prince? Genesis? Maybe a rookie band? A new wave band? Even a one-hit wonder? It's a nostalgic trip back to my favorite year in music history. What do you think? Is it the greatest year? Let's talk about it next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever asked that time-old question, age-old question, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. This is your channel. Daily Dose of Nostalgia Through Music. Make sure to subscribe below right now to be a part of our Music History Daily, straight from the artists, and also to become an honorary producer on our Patreon for even more uh, content. Check us out on Patreon below, and uh, check out our Vintage Years collection, the merch below. So it's time for another edition of our show, The Hit Song Redux. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of the rock and roll era, and we re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on how much the world has listened to them since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. There's always a lot of great surprises here. As always, we're including artists' interviews, in-depth commentary, as well as your stories, your dedications. Just to clarify, this is not my personal top 10. It's the actual top 10 from this exact week, almost 40 years ago. First, we count them down as they were, and then we run them through a recalibration process to find out the real top 10 based on all time streams and views. It's really actually pretty cool. Now, before we get started, I wanna give a shout out to my hero, the great Casey Kasem and his program, The American Top 40 Countdown. We really do this show in honor of his memory. Uh, so to help place us in the proper pop culture context of the day, let's take a look at some of the uh, movies and TV shows of the time. For example, there were some classic 80s movies just about to hit theaters including a film starring a relatively unknown actor named Kevin Bacon. Of course, I'm talking about... Let's dance! Footloose. The other day, one of my son's friends said, who's Kevin Bacon? And I thought, what is going on with this world? <laughs> Kevin Bacon. He's the new kid in town, and the music's on his side. Also close to premiering was... Uh, what has been billed as the funniest rock movie ever made, which I agree with, this is Spinal Tap. This is Spinal Tap. And also the Michael Douglas, Kathleen Turner action adventure rom-com, Romancing the Stone. Secondly, she's got herself a partner. Who likes shooting holes and everything. On TV, you can catch the first season of Night Court. or the last season of Three's Company. Come and knock on our door. Come and knock on our door. We've been waiting for you. And if you were watching Saturday morning cartoons, you got up at the crack of dawn, uh, there was a good chance you might have been watching the cartoon adaptation of Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeon Master, your guide in the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. Even Snorks. <laughs> or uh, if you had cable, maybe He-Man. And the masters of the universe. I had so many He-Man action figures. My brother and I had all of them. You know, this meme pretty much sums up how I feel. Starting off the countdown at number 10, it's one of the best songs from one known as the Rocket Man, who was actually kind of trying to find his footing in the 80s after ruling the 70s. Talking about Sir Elton John with, I guess that's why they call it the blues. I guess that's why they call it the blues. John. Call of the Blues was the first single from John's 17th studio album, Too Low for Zero. In the U.S., this song became one of Elton's biggest hits of the 80s. It climbed to number two for four weeks on the adult contemporary chart, and it uh, peaked at number four in the Hot 100. Don't wish it away. Like 1983 would actually be a comeback of sorts for Elton John. For the first time since 1976's album Blue Moves, 
All of Elton's lyrics were written by longtime friend and collaborator Bernie Taupin. Uh, original band members Davy Johnstone, Dee Murray, and Nigel Olson together rounded out the group. One additional musician making an appearance on this particular song was actually uh, musical genius Stevie Wonder. Man, he turned in just a stellar harmonica solo, one of his best of the decade. This is actually my favorite Elton John song of the 80s. According to co-writer Davy Johnstone, writing the song came very easily. Apparently, the lyrics were inspired by a letter that Toppin wrote to his second wife, model Tony Russo. Call It the Blues became the first John Toppin composition to break the top 10 since 1976. It's good to have the two back in action together, for sure. In at the number nine spot, it's a legendary Yacht Rock captain who had just swept the Grammys a couple of years before, you know, back when people actually cared about the Grammys. It's kind of sad. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, Christopher Cross with Think of Laura. Think of Laura left Formerly a member of Texas rock band Flash, Christopher Cross signed with Warner Brothers on the strength of his songwriting talents. His 1979 self-titled debut was filled with smooth AOR songs, perfect for radio play, including the number two hit, Ride Like the Wind. Backing vocals by the great Michael McDonald. And of course, the chart-topping Sailing. Cross, like I said, won five Grammys in 81, including Album of the Year. Also in 81, Cross also sing and co-wrote the theme song, Arthur's theme, Best That You Can Do, for the top grossing movie, Arthur. If you get between the moon and New York that song gave him another number one hit. Moving from the big screen to the small screen, though, Cross's next top 10 hit, Think of Laura, that was featured on the ABC television series, General Hospital. His kid would remember that, became the love theme for the daytime power couple Luke and Laura, who were arguably the, the most popular soap opera couple at that time. Laura, Their 1981 wedding was the highest rated episode in U.S. soap opera history. Today is a day of joyous celebration. However, Christopher Cross wrote this song about a completely different Laura. Laura Carter, actually a teenage student at Denison University in Granville, Ohio. In 82, Laura was riding in a car with her parents and three friends when gunfire erupted just a block away. Sadly, a stray bullet hit her in the chest, tragically taking her life. At the time, Christopher Cross was dating Laura's best friend, Paige McNinch. The song would always be a tribute to Laura Carter, first and foremost. Coming in at number eight, it's the second single from the 1983 album, Uh Huh, song that hits me in the heart every time. The Heartland Rocker hit, Pink Houses by John Mellencamp. According to Mellencamp, Pink Houses was inspired while he was driving home from the Indianapolis airport. Along the way, as he was driving, he saw an old man sitting on the porch of his pink shack. Said John Mellencamp, he waved and I waved right back. That's how the song started. That simple exchange caused John to wonder if this is what life leads to. Is this as good as it gets? Is this the American dream? But then John thought, wait, what if the man is actually happy and doesn't feel like the world owes him anything? Who am I to judge this guy or his feelings? Pink Houses was a creative breakthrough for John Mellencamp, who was able to see, in this one instance, the beauty of millions of people striving to find fulfillment in their lives. It would lead to more compositions about his personal observations of you know, real human struggles. Little pink houses for you and me. It helped him to secure a reputation for capturing individual experiences and turning them into a microcosm of life in the heartland of America, thus where the genre came from. Yeah. 
As we arrive at the number seven position, I do want to recognize our sponsors, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses you see me wearing every single day. Go to our link uh, right up here, I think it's here or here, or go right below in the description to get the best prices at zenny.com, where you design your own glasses with scores of styles and colors and shapes for you to choose from, starting at just $6.95. Yeah, seven bucks. It can't be beat. Try it today. Tell them that Professor Rock sent you. So at the number seven position, it's another hit from a 1983 album that gave everyone a run for their money uh, back in that time from a man who had a record nine straight years of the number one hit, either sung or written. Talking about Mr. Lionel Richie with Running With The Night. His album Can't Slow Down never did slow down on the charts. I mean, Running With The Night spotlights the rock and roll side of his vocal skill set. The writing and recording of Running With The Night, that was enhanced by a number of guest musicians, including future adult contemporary artist Richard Marks on backing vocals. Actually helped give Richard a start. Also Toto Steve Lukather, he performed a guitar solo on the track. And also contributing as co-writers with Lionel Richie were uh, Hall of Fame lyricist uh, Cynthia Weil and her husband Barry Mann. Uh, these two have composed some of the most beloved songs in the history of popular music, including You've Lost That Love and Feeling, which I need to release our piece on that. Uh, I've interviewed Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil. Here's what they had to say about Running With The Night. Lionel just gave me the melody and um, said, write me a music video. Coming in at the number six position here on the countdown, uh, we have a song that's a, a very underrated hit. It kind of gets lost in the shuffle of this band because they've had so many hits. Talking about That's All by Genesis from the band's 1983 self-titled album. Always the same, it's just a shame, and that's all. Now, that's all was the song that really started the pop career for Genesis, especially here in America. I mean, up to that point, Genesis's is uh, their highest charting Hot 100 hit was Misunderstanding that went to number 14 in 1980. I mean, not a bad showing, don't get me wrong, but not quite top 10 territory where Genesis and Phil Collins would plant their flag for the rest of the 80s. Say we'll be together. Simple and radio friendly, that's all is a song about a dying relationship. In it, Colin sings about being in a rut. It's always the same, it's just a shame, and that's all. Phil Collins actually went as far as saying in an interview that the song features an attempt at a Ringo Starr drum part, which according to keyboardist Tony Banks, was reminiscent of a Rocky Raccoon. Rocky Raccoon. He fell back in his room. I could say day and you'd say night. Tell me the song begins with Tony Banks playing the main riff of this song on a Yamaha CP70 electric grand piano. Banks was one of the first to use digital samplers in the early 80s. Uh, Banks would record his bandmate Mike Rutherford as he played around on his instruments and then craft those samples into a track. This is basically how this song developed. Really cool song, uh, one to definitely go back and look at. Okay, so we've made it halfway through the countdown, and at number five, we've got a song that absolutely ruled MTV. It ruled rock radio, and it helped an album named after the year it came from sell millions of copies. I'm talking about Jump by Van Halen. The genesis of Jump rewinds uh, to the back of a tour bus in the late 70s where Eddie Van Halen began creating a chord sequence that would go through multiple iterations into the early 80s. Eddie's original melody embraced more pop sensibilities when he was inspired by the synthesizer sound used in Daryl Hall and John Oates number one smash, Kiss on My List from 1981. It's cool when you play the track, so let's, let's show it here.
As the track developed, Eddie played it for the band, you know, hoping to finish it for their 1981 uh, Fair Warning LP. However, his band brothers flat out rejected it. Eddie again submitted the track for consideration for 1982's Diver Down. But his bandmates and producer Ted Templeman nixed the idea there as well. But let's be honest, I mean, synthesizers and keyboards were all but forbidden in the hard rock culture of the early 80s. It's a well-known story when it comes to Van Halen, the fight that went on there. Eddie wanted to play the synth, Diamond Dave was not having it. You know, DLR, you remember, was the biggest opponent of this idea, believing that a song like Jump would not fit the Van Halen sound at all. He feared that Van Halen's core fans would accuse the band of selling out. But Eddie was never satisfied with the status quo, as we all know, and he had a hunch that the right song with a synth hook could be huge and really propel the band to even greater heights, bigger audience. So he went on the offensive and he built his own studio, 5150. There he would lay down the music and basically force the group to record their next album, 1984, his way. So if you lived through the 80s, you know exactly what happened next. 1984 and Jump changed the face of hard rock. It brought Van Halen to the MTV masses in a huge way. And nothing gets me down. Fueled by Jump, 1984 would sell over 15 million copies around the world. I guess if you want to hear the rest of the story, check out our episode on Jump. We do an in-depth breakdown there. Our viewers had a lot to say about this song. Viewer Matt Whaley said, I remember being in elementary school, probably third grade, and our school did a fundraiser called Jump Rope for Heart. I totally remember that. This is where people would donate so much per minute of you jump roping. Whoever raised the most money got the top prizes out of some cheesy catalog. I hated it, but they would play Van Halen's Jump like every other song on a record player hooked to the PA system. Jump. Around the same time, I bought a cassette of 1984 and I still have it. Growing up in the 80s was pretty damn awesome. I have to agree with you, Mr. Whaley. I have to agree with you. Screen name Will Andy Walker said, I was considering a very big career change and my wife sent me a video stating that in life you need to jump at your chance to be successful. Walked outside and hit random on a playlist and of course, jump came on. I was stunned. Made a career change. Best decision ever. Thanks, Van Halen. Very cool. Jump. Heading into the number four spot, it's a progressive rock band staple. I'm talking about Yes delivering a quintessential 80s classic with Owner of a Lonely Heart. Now this song split longtime fans of the band apart. From the album 90125, Owner of a Lonely Heart was one of the biggest songs at 84. It ultimately reached number one on the Hot 100 and the US rock chart as well. Originating from South African musician, singer, songwriter, and producer Trevor Rabin. The song actually came to him while he was on the toilet. Apparently he wrote the whole thing from beginning to end, right then and there, on the pod. Raven then recorded his ideas on a tape using some home equipment, including a four-track tape machine. For 90125 producer Trevor Rabin, gave Yes more of a pop orientation. Made sure that tracks like Owner of a Lonely Heart rocked hard enough to appease you know, the longtime fans while pulling in that top 40 audience that everybody really wanted in the 80s. Now, I had the opportunity to sit down with lead singer John Anderson in a Zoom interview and ask him about this song. Here's a little part of that. So me and Trevor wrote the first uh, part of the first verse together. And then he said, look, I'm going to leave it to you. You know what you're doing. OK, so we're getting closer to that coveted number one slot. We're coming in at number three, and it's the new wave masterpiece from a band that, after this hit, disappeared for a decade due to a lawsuit. It's Talking In Your Sleep by The Romantics. The Romantics burst onto the scene with the 1980 classic, What I Like About You. Even though it actually stalled at number 49, it became one of the most played songs on classic rock radio. What I like about you. 
released. A few years later, the Romantics released Talking In Your Sleep, and it shot to number three on the pop charts, went to number two on the rock charts, and it went to number one on the dance charts. Triple threat. We talked about this a few months ago, but here's what the Romantics said about it, just a part of it. Much different with any other song. It's yeah. just that you kind of uh, don't think and you kind of just play and feel, and then you take it to your rehearsal studio. At that point, let's just hit it hard. Let's do a hey and then go right to the harp solo. And that and little other things, hand claps here and there. and. All right, so we've made it to the number two position. Talking about the runner-up, the proverbial bridesmaid spot here. This song is by a band who were no strangers to the top of the charts, whether it be pop, R&B, or dance. It's Cool in the Game with Joanna from their 1983 record, In the Heart. Joanna. So between 1969 and 1982, Cool and the Gang had 30 top 40 hits on the US R&B charts. They had 13 top 40 hits on the Hot 100 charts, including the number one smash celebration in 1980. Sing. Good times. Come on. For Joanna, guitarist Clades Charles Smith brought this song uh, to the band under the name Dear Mom. However, saxman Ronald Bell recommended some changes. He turned it into a romantic ballad. One of the key changes was to give the song a new title to you know, capitalize on the name song trend that was going on. You know, Toto's Rosanna, and I could name a bunch of others. Rosanna, Rosanna. Oh, oh, see the, see the, oh. Joanna was the first single off In the Heart, but originally the band had no intention of releasing it. However, only a few days before the release of In the Heart, Cool in the Game performed at New York's Radio City Music Hall. And when they got to Joanna, the crowd had quite a reaction. Longtime friend of the band, Cleveland Brown, remembered what happened exactly. He said, well, the Radio City crowd got so frenzied by the chorus and horn break, people jumping up and down as if it were a hit anthem already. group was taken by surprise. They were looking at each other, wondering what was up. But they tried it again the next night and the next. And I remember Ronald Bell came backstage and said, and they went berserk. I guess that's going to be the first single. Very cool. Joanna. Okay, so here we are. We finally made it to the number one song from this week in 1984. It's by a band that shook up the American charts as much as any British act not named The Police or Duran Duran, capping off a full-fledged second British invasion that started a few years before this. Talking about Culture Club with their signature song, Karma Chameleon. Lead vocalist Boy George O'Dowd formed Culture Club back in 1981 in London. Additionally, the band was comprised of guitarist Roy Hay, bassist Mikey Craig, and drummer John Moss. The foursome quickly shot to fame with their first eight singles reaching the top 20 in the U.S., starting with the number two hit, Do You Really Want to Hurt Me, in 1982. And Time Clock of the Heart, that also went to number two. However, Karma Chameleon would do them both one better, claiming the band's only number one ranking in their career. Come, 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 the entire group would get songwriting credit for this song with the addition of Phil Pickett, former keyboardist of the 70s UK band Sailor. Uh, he also contributed keyboards and backing vocals to Culture Club. Boy George explained to the LA Times that this song is about uh, this terrible fear of alienation that people have. Uh, the fear of standing up for one thing. What we're saying is, if you aren't true, if you don't act like you feel, then you get karma. Justice. That's nature's way of paying you back. One of the best pop culture references for this song for the time is when Boy George guest starred in a 1986 episode of The A-Team called Cowboy George. I love that episode. Guess who's coming to the A-Team? Boy George and the Culture Club! 
Club. And that episode, a series of misadventures leads to Boy George and Culture Club playing a country bar to a bunch of cowboys. So get in on the act, because things are going to be rocking. And stop it. They win over the crowd, along with the A-team, who bob along with the tune. What next? When Boy George meets the A-team, Tuesday. I'm rolling. So our viewers had a lot of fond memories about this song as well. I'm going to share a couple. Screen names someone else entirely said, which, by the way, I love that screen name. Uh, said, the uh, dumbest fist fight I've ever been in. My friend kept seeing Karma Chameleon as loving would be easy if you color collide my dreams. And I finally corrected her, loving would be easy if your colors were like my dreams. Loving would be easy if your colors were like my dreams. My friend did not appreciate the correction and sucker punched me. We went about eight rounds before it was over. Jack Daniels will get you in trouble every time, end of quote, okay. And viewer Maria Plummer shared this story. My first brush with what I would later realize was real love was with a boy who loved Culture Club and practically idolized Boy George. At the time I was 13 and he was 14, right at uh, Culture Club's height of popularity. We would sing Karma Chameleon and other songs of theirs together on a loop. Sadly, my father did not approve of him and eventually forbade me from even speaking to him on the phone. When I was 16, he was tragically killed in a brutal car crash, leaving me devastated. I hadn't seen him for over a year by that point, but I was still madly in love with him and hoping our paths might accidentally cross again someday. But that was never to be realized. To this day, whenever I hear Karma Chameleon come on the radio, I turn up the volume and I sing my heart out, remembering that boy and how much I loved him. It sounds like we should do a uh, dedication from Maria to this boy. Glad that the music brings back that memory and uh, you can remember. Karma, 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 so as I was working on this 1984 Redux, you know, I was showing some of these songs to my 14-year-old son. And he was saying how much he just loves these songs and how much he listens to them. And he asked me a question. He said, you know, Dad, why do today's top 40 charts not have songs of this caliber? And we ended up having a long conversation about this. It's too much to cover here. But then he said something really funny. He said, you know why my generation is depressed, why we're so messed up? Because our music sucks. <laughs> I laughed for a long time. There's definitely good music being recorded right now just doesn't make it into the charts. For example, here's a little uh, taste of comparing this week's songs to the songs that are on the charts right now. Need to find you hey, hey, All right, let's recalibrate the top 10 base on all time streams and views. Drum roll, please. Here's your new top 10, 39 years later. And number 10, it's Running With The Night by Lionel Richie with 21 million streams. Holding Pat at number nine, it's Christopher Cross and Think of Laura with 48 million streams. Number eight, it's cool in the gang, and Joanna falling six spots, but still garnering 53 million streams. Joanna. Coming up next at number seven, Pink Houses by John Mellencamp with 109 million streams. Number six is Genesis with That's All, reaching 146 million streams. Halfway through at number five, The Romantics and Talking in Your Sleep were a total of 149 million streams. At number four, it's our biggest jump of the countdown with Sir Elton John. And I guess that's why they call it the Blues, climbing six spots, tallying quarter of a billion streams. Next at number three, Owner of a Lonely Heart by Yes at 292 million streams. Okay, we're almost there. Number two, closing in on a billion streams with 901 million. 
It's Jump by Van Halen. So there's no change at number one. We got Boy George and Culture Club keeping that crown with an incredible 1.2 billion streams. So there it is, the new top 10 from this very same week in 1984. Make sure that you share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the new top 10? Yeah, if we did not get to your dedication or your memory, we will. Keep sharing them with us in the comments, sharing your memories. Best thing to do right now. If you like this, we do invite you to subscribe. Check us out on Patreon. Let us know what's the next countdown. What year should we do next? Let us know in the comments. Thank you so much. And until next time, three chords and the truth.